Okay. Oh, let me shut this on. <laughs> okay. It's the, if we do that, we'll be here forever. So, let's start him up. Okay, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight to our first philosophy intersections of the fall semester. Uh, tonight, uh, Dr. Don Seastrom. Professor of Art, and myself, Dr. Anthony McCauley, will be presenting uh, Wings Too Weak, Authentic Knowledge in Dante's Divine Comedy. And I'm going to just start us off by handing it over to Dr. Seastrom. Thank you so much. Like most people, I was first introduced to the Divine Comedy when I was in high school. Yes, we actually had literature when I was in high school. Um, as is true in most cases, what we read was and I can remember see, thinking that this was a little unsatisfying, and I wasn't really sure why. Then later, when I was doing my doctoral studies, I had the opportunity of doing the course on the entire comedy. Um, I had the good fortune of being able to work with Joseph Meeker and John Talmadge, who are both Dantean scholars and speak fluent Italian. Um, Joseph Meeker is, in fact, the great-grandson of the person who founded Meeker, Colorado. Um, in considering the understanding of the Divine Comedy, one thing that I want you to understand, this is not going to be a literary review, because this is, in fact, the sum total of the work a bit too large to go through on a very in-depth basis. But I did want to give you some information on Dante and how this particular work came about. Dante was born in 1265. Very little is known about his formal education or whether, in fact, there was a level of formal education. But during his life, there certainly would have been experience for him to become familiar with the Dominicans who were centered in Florence in Santa Maria Novella, the Augustinians who were centered in Santa Spiritu, and the Franciscans in Santa Croce. If you know Florence at all, these are three major churches in the area. People will ask, why are there these major churches in Florence. Well, at this time, with these particular individuals, this was as much a community of scholars, of educators, as they were centers of religious consideration. If you know anything about Catholicism, you would know that these groups did not get along very well. Also, Dante most likely would have been would have known about the developments that were going on in Paris at the time, which dealt with a re-emergence of Aristotelian thought. There were two branches, two concepts that were being presented. One saw human reason, independent of faith and grace, as having sufficient force to find God. The second, the more radical, believed that human, re uh, human reason was sufficient means of attaining happiness, a philosophy completely independent of theology. Dante and his family were not a real major force in Florentine politics, but he was involved in Florentine politics and was involved in the exiling of certain individuals from Florence. Well, in 1302, because of his activities, he and his family were exiled from Florence. It was during this exile 
that the comedy was written. And in his publishing of it, it was the comedy. It was not the divine comedy. The term the divine comedy did not come about until 1555 when an edition of the entire work was published in Venice. It then carried the term the divine comedy. Dante died in 1321 in Ravenna, Italy. That's where he's buried. A lot of people think he's buried in Florence because there's a nice sculpture of him outside of Santa Croce, but he's not. On several occasions over the past few hundred years, Florence has asked for his remains to be returned. Ravenna says no. So if you want to find Dante, you've got to go to Ravenna. <laughs> in looking at the Divine Comedy, what I was going to focus in on are three concepts. Vision, perception, and interpretation. Particular in relationship to the concept of cosmos and chaos. Chaos is often defined as being disorder, confusion, bedlam, turmoil. Cosmos, on the other hand, is order and understanding. Dante, like Orpheus's search for Eurydice, takes him on a physical journey into the metaphysical. Therefore, all aspects of vision, perception, and interpretation must be considered from the perspective of an altered state of awareness. At the beginning of the story, Dante finds himself in a wood. He is in a state of confusion. He's not sure where he is. He is only aware that he is, has lost a path. Now in studying this, I found it very interesting that in some classical literature, in a good deal of medieval literature, Dreams that take place at daybreak are those which come true. So here you have the setting. This begins at daybreak. Dante could have set this at any particular time. He sets it at daybreak. So is this a dream or is it an actual occurrence? It's irrelevant. It's a story. I've often wondered why this did not become a religious text. Once I went and started preparing for this, it became quite apparent to me that this is a statement of philosophy and a statement of politics and not a religious concept. Dante is in a state of chaos. Dante is in a state of confusion. Who shows up? Virgil. Virgil is identified as classical reasoning, classical wisdom. And Virgil offers to lead Dante through a series of realms. From the onset, one of the most important questions posed in these volumes is the nature of authentic understanding versus simply knowing. In Cantos 3, we, are, we find the very first one of these particular quandaries. This is the inscription above the gate of the inferno. It reads, Through me the way into the suffering city. Through me the way to eternal pain. Through me the way that runs amongst the lost. Justice urged my higher artificer. Artificer is one who builds something. My maker was divine authority, the highest wisdom, and primal love. Before me, nothing but eternal things were made, and I endure eternally. Abandon every hope who enter here. Dante is confused. Dante knows what the thing says he does not understand. He says, these words, their aspect were obscure. I read, inscribed above a gate, and I said, Master, their meaning is difficult for me. 
and he to me as one who comprehends. Here one must leave behind all hesitation. Here every cowardice must meet its death. For we have reached the place of which I spoke. We will see the miserable people, those who have lost the good of the intellect. As readers, we also know what the inscription says. But there is a question. How is it that the inferno is created from the highest wisdom, from primal love? What is the implication of the words, abandon every hope who enter here? Is this a statement of punishment and a call to despair? Although the inscription may, may seem to elicit despair, it does so only if we interpret the concept of hope in one way. At this point in the comedy, that might be the only conclusion. But like the comedy itself, the concept of hope, as expressed in the inscription, cannot be understood until the whole work is completed. The journey must be finished or we are left with only limited, incomplete, and flawed perspectives. A failure both of perception and interpretation. Now because sin is often associated with concepts of hell, in this case the inferno, it, that is to say sin, is often read into the description of the inscription on the gate. However, in the inscription, nor where, anywhere else, is the word sin ever used. Through me the way that runs amongst the lost. Not the damned, not the sinful, but the lost. And what is it that they have lost? The good of the intellect. The word sin does not enter the poem or our interpretation until it is uttered by Virgil in his description of the condition of the shades, not souls, but shades, encountered in limbo. Sin as a concept is expressed not by the divine authority, the highest wisdom, primal love, but by one of the shades who is himself, Virgil, locked in limbo. In this way, the why a shade is placed in limbo, or any other part of the inferno, is first presented not by a divine authority, but by one of its inhabitants. The shades in limbo are without sin, yet they acknowledge having been placed in their location by reason of external authority. Is this justice articulated in the inscription? What's just about those without sin being relegated to limbo and kept out of paradise? Virgil's explanation they remain located in limbo and refuse to question authority. This is a reoccurring theme of all of the shades located in the inferno. The belief that an outside authority has determined their fate. The question, is this an authentic authority or merely the interpretation of authority? The Inferno offers one answer, Purgatorio offers somewhat different answer, and Paradiso a truly revolutionary and revelatory reply. Continuing on past limbo, the physical atmosphere becomes more and more polluted. The ability to see clearly is diminished. Here Dante is alerting us to the fact that reliance on our vision and therefore our perception and interpretation is going to be tested. In Canto V of the Inferno, the second cir circle, the lustful, Dante encounters two of the best known contemporary figures of the entire comedy, Francesca and Paolo. Francesca and Paolo were lovers, killed by Francesco's husband, who was Paolo's Francesca and Paolo, I'm sorry, um, the events of this were well known in Dante's time. This is an actual event that took place. What Dante was able to do here was to personalize rather than personify the notion 
of lustful activity. The fundamental nature of the shades combined in the Inferno, which is turmoil, which is a part of chaos, is shown in conversation with Francesca. Although locked back to back in a whirlwind, a tornado, with Paolo, Francesca never acknowledges Paolo's existence. She is only aware of her own situation, a type of malevolent individualism. She represents all of the characters in the Inferno, self-involved, desiccated, accepting without question external authority. They reveal, they reveal a lack of awareness of options and possibilities, constricted by their egocentric natures. As Dante and Virgil descend through the uh, subsequent levels of the Inferno, each identifying the supposed punishment for different transgression, they eventually come to the ninth level, which is treachery. Within that, there is treachery to kin, treachery to homeland or party, treachery to guests, and treachery to benefactors. It is at the fourth terrace of the ninth level of the inferno that one of the most compelling and philosophically defining images comes into the Inferno. Unlike most depictions of Lucifer, and there's an interesting choice of words there, Lucifer and not Satan, as depicting and involved in the origins of interceding evil, Dante depicts Lucifer forever locked, not in fire, but in ice. Treachery is represented by the never-ending consumption of Judas, Brutus, and Cassius. Although there's no evidence within the text, I am sure that Dante knew of Plato's assertion regarding the self-conceptive nature of evil. Plato asserts that no one would engage in evil if they understood the harm that it would do to their soul. In, canto, in this canto, we are presented with a depiction of the consumptive nature of evil along with its utter futility. Lucifer is as concerned, consumed in the lake as is his consumption of the three traitors. When Lucifer fans his wings, the resulting wind freezes the lake. Therefore, the action of evil, exemplified by Lucifer fanning his wings, results in his confinement in the lake of ice. Utter futility. And yet Lucifer, like all of the others in the Inferno, accepts without question the circumstances of his confinement. At the midpoint of this canto, Canto 24, one of the most interesting descriptions of conceptual transposition takes place. Once at the center of the Inferno, the journey must continue. To climb out of the Inferno, Virgil takes Dante and begins to climb down. Dante is once again confused because he believes we were going back to the inferno. I raised my eyes, believing I should see that half of Lucifer that I had left. Instead, I saw him with his legs turned up. Knowing that the journey to continue, knowing that the journey to continue, they must be able to return to the surface, all movement is now down and out from the center. This ingenious device of spatial transposition alerts the reader to the fact that everything presented in the Inferno is not what it first appears to be. They are distortions, inversions. Everything is upside down. The climb from the Inferno places Dante and Virgil once again on the surface of the Earth in the Southern Hemisphere. As the entire poem is an archetypal journey from ignorance to knowledge, or a movement towards grace, <coughs> purgatory depicts the classic ascension journey. While the inferno depicts the human condition in terms of folly, human selfishness, malevolent individualism, purgatory sets a different tone. Although the transgressions are the same as in the inferno, 
the attitudes of the shades is different. There is still a perception of divine authority, yet there is a shift from isolation and self-deception to the acceptance of personal responsibility. The shades are responsible for their actions while alive, a fundamental existential shift. One of the most important differences between the condition of the shades in the inferno and purgatory is the action of cooperation. While the shades in the inferno are static, unchanging, the shades in purgatory are dynamic. In the inferno, the perception of cooperation does not exist, while cooperation is the norm in purgatory. At the summit of purgatory lies the earthly paradise. In Cantos 30 of Purgatory, Virgil departs because he believes that he cannot enter the par earthly paradise. He holds to the mindset of all of those in the inferno, as well as those, and all those in limbo, as well as those in the inferno. He cannot conceptualize the possibility of asking for assistance to move out of limbo. Virgil representing classical reason, reason that is insufficient to lead him to self-actualization, the self-actualization identified by Aristotle. Before he departs, Virgil gives Dante a final benediction. Virgil tells Dante that he has a renewed will, one that is truly free and that he may go without fear through the boundary of fire that separates the seventh terrace from the earthly paradise. Yet Dante hesitates. Dante is scared. In the poem, it refers to the fact that he remembers seeing the bodies burned in his youth, which would have been during the plague. Dante hesitates until he knows that Beatrice, the woman that has died and sent him on this journey, is awaiting him on the other side. He goes through the fire, the final sense of purification. Throughout the journey, Dante has been able to assess the difference between the chaotic nature of the inferno and the movement towards cosmos in purgatory. Yet the authentic nature of both realms is still not clear because the journey has not been realized. A limited perspective, it is in Paradiso, that cosmos, order, is realized. Purgatory presents a surprisingly existential view of responsibility. The transgressions of those in the inferno and purgatory result from the living of extreme lives. Again, an Aristotelian interpretation. The first two volumes of the poem represent knowable conditions. Although descriptions of exceptional occurrence, both volumes make reference to physical experience. When Dante moves into paradise, he attempts to identify the undefinable and to know the unknowable. As the poem moves towards resolution, Dante presents not only specific Christian philosophical concepts, but a much broader understanding of both chaos and cosmos. As Dante ascends towards the Empyrean through the celestial spheres, a concept based on Ptolemaic ideas of the universe, he looks back and finds the earth becoming very, very small. As the earth is perceived diminishing in size, so too is the once impressive scale and proportion of the inferno. Located inside the earth, the inferno, upon first encounter, appears enormous and daunting. During his ascent, Dante realizes that the earth itself is only a limited part within the greater whole of existence. The authentic grandeur and the fear of evil's enormity is mitigated by the growing understanding of the singularity of existence. Einsteinian relativist thinking in the 14th century. In the Empyrean, the 10th heaven, 
Dante, the poet, presents a tour de force of literary, scientific, and philosophical insight. Dante, the pilgrim, is told that the Empyrean is outside of time. Because it is outside of time, it is also outside the normal concept of space. Space has become unbounded. No distinction can be made between one place and another. There is no here and there. There is only here, and here is everywhere. This is a remarkably close concept to what I understand the grand unified field theory of physics being. In this understanding, chaos is only an illusion. What is perceived as chaotic, unauthentic knowledge is only a segmented portion of a greater organic whole. We only perceive chaos because we cannot see the total system. Because the Imperium is a grand unified field encompassing me, all of existence, outside of time and space, space, Earth, the Inferno, Purgatory, and the nine preceding heavens are all in the Imperium. The extraordinary revelation is that the inferno is not outside of paradise, but it is in fact placed in heaven. The chaos, unauthentic knowledge of those in the inferno and paradiso exist only because the shades perceive a limited view, a limited interpretation of the organic whole, chaos. They do not see the total system as a single working unity of cosmos. As a result of this misinterpretation, theirs is illusion, theirs is chaos, theirs is punishment. The enigma of the gate inscription, identifying the realm's architecture as being constructed from the highest wisdom and primal love is resolved. There is no contradiction, both paradise and the inferno coexist with paradise in a single unity occupying unbounded time and space. It is only their ability or inability to perceive the authentic singular working unity of grace, cosmos, that truly differentiates the inhabitants. Abandon hope. Hope is a desired outcome. Hope is a passive rather than an active concept. Mm -hmm. Abandon hope and achieve realization. Because hope is not required. Awareness through intellect replaces chaos, inauthentic understanding, with cosmos, authentic understanding. Those in the inferno, in chaos, are there because of a limited vision. They choose to see only a fraction of the whole. Their plight is not the result of divine intervention, but rather of plaintive self-delusion. Those in limbo remain there only because they do not understand that they are in paradise. Those who place themselves in purgatory are gaining understanding. Those in paradise experience understanding they have achieved cosmos unity. In this work, Dante challenges us to step outside our preconceived ideas, our limited perspectives, and find authentic truth, understanding which is unbounded by time and space. Thank you. I'll scroll to these when I need to, but I just want to have these up here for just in case we need them, and I will make them bigger. But um, I want to pick up on the philosophical aspects of uh, what Dante was doing here, because this idea that there's awareness through an intellect, that you can use your logic to be fully aware 
of your place is something that Thomas Aquinas, right, who was, um, sorry, wait a minute, there we go, there we go, Thomas Aquinas, who was born in 1225, um, a, you know, about a century or so before Dante, yeah. okay, Thomas Aquinas presents us with a philosophy that is manifested and expressed in the Divine Comedy. And the Divine Comedy, in my mind, and after listening to Don, uh, represents a shift in the conceptualization of the authentic relationship between the mind and the body. It moves away from a platonic view of a strict dualist metaphysics of mind-body, meaning that the mind is separate from the body, the mind or the soul is trapped in the body, so the body acts as a cage for the soul. Um, instead, Dante's system is a Tomasian rendering of a necessary unity of mind and body to create a composite human who is capable of recognizing, understanding, and living in accord with divine or authentic logic. And that logic makes the human more authentic. Right? Now, the thing to remember here is that to be human for St. Thomas Aquinas means that you have an aspect in yourself of perfection. Your soul is a perfect entity, and your soul can know things logically. Its access to logic, its thinking, is in and of itself perfect. Okay? This, is the, this is the tricky part because a lot of people don't realize that, you know, how revolutionary Aquinas was being in this. But even though we are a unified body, we are a unified body for a specific purpose. Right? The unification of the mind and body for Aquinas basically means that the body is there to help align the soul, to help bring the soul into the realm of divine logic. And it can only go so far. The revolutionary aspect of Thomas Aquinas has always been the fact that Aquinas put forth all of these proofs of the existence of God, and he basically took them apart. And he said, basically, that as human beings, we can't know with certainty whether or not God exists. We can't. We just can't. We can have faith, but we can't know with certainty. And we can't know with certainty because we are human. It's only after we die and the soul leaves the body that we can be aware fully, that our logic can be fully expressed. But the reason we have a body is so that we can make a choice. You see, without a body, if you are pure logic, there's no choices to be made because you know everything anyway. So there's no choices to be made. You literally know all. You are part of logic. You are part of that Aristotelian movement, that divine kind of movement, that this, this constant, uh, permanent movement. So when you are human, you don't have the benefit of that om omniscience. So you have to make a leap of faith. And that, for Aquinas, is what makes us special. That is what makes us different from animals. That is what makes us different from things without souls. Because we have to make an active choice as to whether or not we want to align ourselves with that divine logic. So if we look at logic as this kind of movement or this kind of force, it comes into, it really works in well with this idea that Dante has set, set forward. What we're looking for is an awareness or an awareness that the capacity to understand the full context of our actions resides in the soul, but the body allows that awareness to be expressed. Awareness of our context equals an awareness of past and present and future. 
And that awareness can only occur in an authentic humanity. In other words, a humanity that has aligned itself with the will of God in a religious context. Divine love is equated with divine logic for St. Thomas Aquinas and for Dante. All human beings are a result of God's divine love. It is their origin. So when we're looking at the Empyrean, okay, in, in Paradiso, when we're looking at the Empyrean, um, the, it is the kind of source of movement, the source of logic. So what we're trying to do, what we should be doing, is aligning ourselves toward it, right? And so um, as we put, we become, in, as we bring ourselves into accord with this divine plan, it means that we have to have an awareness that we can return to our origins. And this awareness that we can uh, return to our origins is hope, right? So when we look at the, the, the uh, sign over the uh, gates of hell, abandon all hope, ye who enter here, okay? Lasciate ogni speranza, voi che entrate, okay? Lasciate, pull, pull from yourself, rip this hope. And in so doing, you are wrenching yourself from divine logic. You are wrenching yourself away from it. And that is why sin in the inferno is so centered in the body, because it's only through the body that you can turn away. It's only through the body that you can wrench yourself outside of that divine logic. So when we're looking at that divine logic, the other side of this, ignorance, there's really no sin as much as what Don was saying. There's ignorance. And so if we look at it as ignorance, an authentic intelligence is an awareness of our place in the divine plan and an active movement in accord with it, fully utilizing our human manifestation of our mind and body, fully understanding that unity. Ignorance is an awareness of heaven but an inability to move in accord with it or an unawareness of exactly how to do so. So if we translate that, sin then would be an active turning away from divine logic, an abandonment of one's natural accordance with divine will. So in many ways, sin here is almost an act of hubris to believe that you yourself without some kind of divine intervention, without an awareness of that logic, can make your own choices and still come out on top. And that you can embrace, so, and that's why, the, the, if you look at, you know, when, it, when you look at where the sinners are, the sins on top are sins of incontinence. They're sins of lust and, and greed, just things that, easy things, things that you don't really think about. You just, your body is pulled to them, okay? And this is also plays in this role. What we have, and, and something that really makes this much easier to think about, which is something I should have said in the beginning. I'm just realizing that now. But the thing that makes this easier to understand is that in this time period, including from, actually all the way from Plato, all the way up to, oh, I'd say, close to the mid-1700s. The idea is that emotions, passions, reside in the body. They have nothing to do with the mind. Passions are resident in the body. The mind is pure. The intellect can know itself fully. The intellect can be fully aware of itself. Passions, emotions get in the way. So if those passions are centered in the body, those are the things that if we give in to them can kind of get us off course, kind of impede us. So this idea that sinning or this active turning away is on one level, there's sins of incontinence, which are just giving in to your body, where you're not really just like, oh, okay, 
I, this, I, really, I really want that, you know, gluttony, wrath, right? And it makes sense because when you get mad, right? You don't get mad here. You get mad here. You get mad down and you feel it rising, okay? You feel that, that anger coming up. And, and even with um, um, gluttony, right? Hunger comes from down here, okay? And we don't have to talk about lust, okay? You know where that rises from. So the idea here is that it's the sins, the more serious sins in the inferno are the sins that are a kind of unity, but a perverted unity of mind and body, where you're using your own idea of logic, your own sense of self-serving logic to try to enact your own will. So treachery to benefactors is something that takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of flattery. It takes almost every human gift that you could possibly have. And it has the most consequence to others because treachery means that you have to turn other people as well. You have to use other people. You have to get other people to sin for you to make your sin that much greater. So it's, 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 a, it's an aspect of this perversion of divine logic, which is a selfless logic. And this becomes a selfish logic. So when we see in Dante's Divine Comedy the inscription over hell, okay, abandon all hope, shows that the sinner is fully responsible for actively and knowingly turning away from or rejecting divine logic. But as we've, noted, as we've seen, that is also an illusion, right? So the sinner is doubly, is, is doubly blind, thinks that the actions that they're doing are their own doing, not realizing, the, not realizing it on about two or three different levels, okay? So as we said before, the sever severity of the punishment uh, judged by whether or not the rejection of that logic was active or passive and how much thought went into the rejection itself, right? So when you, when you betray a benefactor, you have to be aware that the person's a benefactor. You have to be aware that you can get stuff out of it. You have to be aware that you are going back on and rejecting their, their good, you know, good nature towards you. Okay? And you have to use your intellect to do it, right? So hell, as an inversion of divine logic, it's an active rejection of the unity of the mind and body. Even though you're using your body to do what you will, you're doing what you want to do. You are doing what the self wants. And what the self wants, it doesn't matter. It's what you should want, what logic wants. And logic wants for nothing. So aligning yourself with this logic is th the way to go. Rejecting that logic, either being blind to it or actively trying to usurp it, is where these sinners, you know, sinners, that's how they get into hell is because as an act of hubris, okay? So the self that the sinners have, the self that the ignorant have, is really an inauthentic self. It is not a real self by Tomasian standards. Now you have to remember, of course, Thomas Aquinas, he was a priest, he was a professor, okay? Professor and a priest, worst of both worlds, <laughs> okay? And he himself was, of course he had an agenda. But the interesting thing about Aquinas here is that he rediscovers Aristotle. The church at this point is very platonic. The church at this point in history is, is, is had, they only had, after the, the collapse of the Roman Empire, the church in Rome had access to Plato and Socrates. The Eastern churches, or what was left in the East, that's where Aristotle was. So Jewish and Muslim scholars had access to Aristotle. 
So Aquinas, being kind of the rebel that he was, was reading things he shouldn't have been reading. He was reading um, theologians, Jewish and, and Muslim theologians, and he was reading, or Jewish and Arab theologians, and he was reading their stuff. And he kept seeing this reference to the great thinker, the great teacher. And the great teacher was Aristotle. And he finally, as a good researcher will do, he dug to see who the source was. And the source was Aristotle. And it's that movement, suddenly he realizes, because as I, said in my, as I say in my classes, when it comes to Aquinas, right? How can you be a good person? I mean, how can you, why would we all be trapped in these bodies? How could these bodies be evil in and of themselves, as had been the kind of perversion of Plato by the church, right? How could these bodies be evil in and of themselves when these are the things that allow us to do good, right? If you're going to worship, you can't just worship with your mind. If you're going to receive, if you're Catholic and you're going to receive a sacrament, that's the deal with a sacrament, is that it is a physical thing. You go through the physical rituals. Most importantly though, you know, denominations aside, even religious views aside, how else are you gonna do good works? How else are you gonna serve others? How else are you gonna show compassion? You don't show compassion with your mind. You show compassion through your active movement, right? And this is something that Aquinas just couldn't, Aquinas couldn't wrap his head around this. So this is why he liked this idea of unity. And on the, the, the whole, like, on the other end of this, the complete polar opposite of this, if you go all the way down at the end of the inferno and you see Satan, Satan is trapped in ice and there's wings, his wings are flapping and it's creating the wind in hell because there's this wind that's constantly kind of blowing. And the flapping of his wings is completely pointless. It is a useless, pointless action. He can't get away. And the wind that's produced, in my opinion, the wind that's produced is a perversion of divine logic. And because it is physical movement rather than logical movement. So the wind that blows through hell is a kind of inversion or perversion of a physical manifestation of the movement of divine logic. So that completes kind of the circle. And as we see this physical manifestation of movement rather than a, a mental or logical one, this is why all of the souls in hell, all of their punishments are punishments of repeated physical action or based solely in the physical because that's what they're going to feel. That's what they're going to know. That's all they can know. Right? And, and the, the souls in hell don't make any sense. I mean, the great thing about the souls in hell is that if you gave them a chance to do it all over again, they totally would. They to knowing exactly what's going on, skin getting ripped off, cut in half, right? disemboweled, decapitated, boiled in shit. Okay? I mean, that, that, that happens. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> all of these things, right? And Dante goes to talk to them, and they're just as wrathful and angry and, and just as awful as they were before. And basically implying that if I had the chance to do it all over again, I still would, right? And you have that Milton-esque movement. That's why Milton comes much later, right? <laughs> that movement, Milton comes much later, right? The movement of I'd rather, you know, uh, rule over hell than serve in heaven, right? That's n no, that's not Aquinas, not at all. Because there's all a bunch of little you know, of little Lucifers in hell that would much rather have their little kingdom of shit. Okay, so this idea here that, that this, this journey out of hell requires an inversion. It requires a flipping of logic that Don talked about. When Dante and Virgil leave hell, they have to invert themselves. They have to flip over because hell, the logic is upside down. The logic doesn't make sense. It's, it's, it's inverted logic. Then you get to purgatory, and 
you have an interesting dynamic where there's an ignorance of process, right? So there's an ignorance of how purgatory exactly works, but there's an understanding of a result. There's an understanding that this means something, that this goes someplace, that this will do something. That's like the beginning of logic. It's the beginning of an awareness that there is a point to this. There is a sense. Now, the, the souls in purgatory are not completely enlightened yet. So they, they're they still working this through with their bodies, but what they're working through with their bodies is something, is a place where it's going to get their minds. All right? So all of the things that they're doing are also versions of things that you do, would do on earth. They're also versions of supplication on earth, versions of worship on earth. So there's still room for hope in purgatory. There's still room for the, the, the idea that this comes to a logical conclusion, <laughs> that this movement moves towards something. And so for me, purgatory re represents a present moment. Okay, It's almost like hell keeps going back over the past. Hell keeps going back over the sin that you did, whereas purgatory places you in a present, kind of, but with an awareness of a future, okay? And it's, it's, but it's a present where a realization can take place. You see, that's what the, the souls in purgatory need, is they need a realization. They need to come to an awareness. And that's why their souls aren't completely free yet. Free, we all know that's all in one place, but their souls aren't free yet because they need that physical space. They need that place where logic can move. They need that place where they can physically understand how things work. They need to get from point A to point B. Right? They can't realize yet that they're all in the same point. They're all in the same singularity. They're on the right trajectory toward heaven. They're moving toward that logic or aligning themselves with it. And then when we get to paradise, in paradise, all thought is in accord with divine logic and movement. And I just want to see if there's a, I had these up here. Well, oh, leave them. So the idea here is that um, all thought is in accord with the divine logic and movement. The souls are aligned with this logic that even though I'm describing it as movement, it doesn't physically move. It is in and of itself thought. It is in and of itself understanding. There's nothing left to understand but the understanding itself, which is very similar to Aristotle's, divine, uh, Aristotle's prime mover. The prime mover in Aristotle it very much looks like God in in Thomas in Aquan, in Thomasian philosophy, and that's there's a reason for that. But the Aristotelian prime mover was not anthropomorphic. The Aristotelian prime mover didn't feel, didn't love, didn't do anything. It just was thought. It was all movement, and it was logical movement, and it was everything. You couldn't have any logic without the prime mover, the first cause of everything. So in the way that kind of Aquinas kind of brings this into a religious realm is to link this logic with love, to say that this logic is an all-encompassing love. It's, it is a leap, okay, but he did have an agenda. He was doing this for a reason, but there was this concept that an everlasting love has no beginning and no end. A true logic has no beginning and no end. It is just thought, right? And it's only through demonstrable things in the world, the physical world, that allow us to come to our answers. So for, for Aristotle, for example, physical, all you're left with is knowing, is logic, is thought. And thought without a body is perfect. There's nothing to limit it.
The souls are in complete union with divine movement. And toward the end, when Dante says, my wings, are too, my wings were too weak for that, when he's trying to understand the enormity, he's trying to understand the cosmos in its entirety. And he still can't. And he can't because he's still human. And he's brought to see this, and he can see only as far as his intellect can go. And his intellect can only go that far because he is still human. But he understands at least how he should be positioned. He understands at least where he needs to be and how he needs to act in relation to that while he is a fully authentic human being. One that knows itself, that knows its own intellect fully, but can't express that intellect fully because that intellect is still within a body. But you do the best you can. And that is where, when you have uh, Thomas Aquinas, the, the strength of that philosophy and why it's, it's so present in the Divine Comedy is because there is this keen awareness, not just of the limitations of the body, but uh, actually an inverting of the platonic idea. And that's to say, that is to say that the body can, in many ways, let that intellect fully manifest itself in the realm of the physical. Because the intellect by itself can't express itself in the realm of the physical but the body can allow it to do so. And that is the truly philosophically revolutionary aspect of Aquinas, is that he very, very subtly raises humanity by saying, yeah, everybody, everybody's soul is perfect. Everybody's intellect is perfect. And you are special, we are special, because we have the capacity to choose, to say yes or to say no. For Aquinas, we have the capacity to choose faith, or we have the capacity to turn away from that faith. In the secular world, where Aquinas is so important, is he allows um, Rene Descartes to say that, no, we can have certainty here too, but not before Aquinas can establish that we have perfect logic in our heads already. So that's all. Thank you. So we'd like to turn it over to questions, if anybody has questions. And I'll bring these up. Yeah. And um, it really exemplified what that area was, is that as the shades, as the souls first enter purgatory, they carry the weight of their sin on their back. On the walls are etchings, are sculptures of all of the, um, what's going on in paradise. It's right there. On the floor that they're walking through, are all of the sins of the inferno. The possibility of knowing paradise is there once they are willing to get rid of that rock off their back. It's there for them to see. And yet, as long as they're carrying that, that migration up, they have got to get rid of that belief in their own sin before they can become and finally actually realize what's going on in paradise. I also think that what Anthony said in regards to this being a living human being was one of the most important concepts of the writing of the Divine Comedy. In a lot of stories, particularly in uh, mythology, when a person is going into the underworld, they, they're dead. They're not coming back. In this it is a living human being. 
Now, I think as Anthony explained, that is a significantly important concept in the overall philosophy that is being expressed here. A being that exists and continues to exist so does not end his existence. It merely gives direction to that existence. A question for both of you with reference to existentialism. Don, you mentioned existentialism. We're talking about existence at the sort of center of this idea of the cosmos. Anthony, you were talking about how choice only has meaning if we have bodies and therefore the choice to turn away from divine mm -hmm. logic, right? And so that's a very kind of existentialist idea that our, our responsibility is heavier when. But one of the things I was trying to understand is that you know, the existentialist, especially Sartre, in, 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 sort of has this atheist stance, right? requires a rejection of the idea of perfection, you know, the idea of the human, right? And so how, how I guess Don, I'm trying to understand how, how you see existentialism here, and then Anthony, how does how do 20th century existentialists take this further, this idea of responsibility through rejection, perhaps rejecting the very thing Dante and Aquinas have us turning toward? Does that make sense? I would see, um, of course, existentialism, as you well know, is a um, grouping of different ideas. Right. Um, Kierkegaard obviously was a religious existentialist. Mm -hmm. In other words, taking responsibility for your actions. <coughs> that you exist and you are responsible for your choices. I see that in Dante, quite clearly in Dante, that those that are in the inferno reject responsibility. They're blaming everybody and everybody else. It's not my fault. It's that Paolo guy that got me in trouble. You know, it's always somebody else or it's God's fault. Right. You know, God put me here. I was just hanging out and God put me down here. It's not really my fault. No acceptance of responsibility. When you get into purgatory, there is an understanding that they are placed in purgatory, but they understand that they are not without fault. If you listen to the shades or the uh, souls that are in infernal, they're all innocent. You know, it's not really my fault. You know, every person in jail is innocent, right? And in that sense, it is more of a concept of existentialism that I think that you would find probably in Heidegger or maybe in Kierkegaard, more so than you would find in either Camus or in Sartre. Um, a, more of a religious-based acceptance of responsibility for your actions within the environment that you find yourself, and not blaming everybody uh, else. Relinquishing your agency. Yes, yes. yes. The, yeah, the easy answer, I mean, in, if, you, if you look at Sartre, if you just follow what Sartre does, which is the idea of just how do you think without God, right? Sartre may, wants to be that activist atheist where he says, you know, just saying that you don't believe in God isn't enough. You have to really think about it and you have to say, well, what does it mean if this isn't here? So take that question and then say, well, what does it mean in, divan in this idea of authenticity and logic if you just take out, erase the concept of God completely? And if you erase that concept, you are left with agency. You are left with human agency and human thinking. And it's human thinking without a net, without a possibility of redemption if you make the wrong choice. Or blame. Or blame, right? But also an aspect, it's without a net on the other side as well because what you realize is that how do you live if there is no reward or punishment at the end of your life, right? And that's what the existentialists wrestle with. And it doesn't come down to, well, you go out and you do whatever the hell you want and you, you, know, you kill everybody and you do this. It's not that. What it is is an understanding of, well, if, if morality doesn't come from a divine authority, right? It comes from humans then humans need to take responsibility for these things. So it is basically just saying, instead of a letting go and, and a turning toward this divine logic, it is instead saying, I'm responsible for this. And there is no, there's no compass, right? The only thing you have that's close to a compass would be Heidegger, the horizon, 
and the horizon of death, which is, the horizon of death is something you move toward, you move toward, you move toward, but you never reach, but it is what gives you a sense of basically a, a topology, it basically gives you a, a, a sense of where you are at, and it gives you a sense of up or down, it gives you a sense of living and dying, and it kind of lends meaning, but it's a meaning that is based on literally nothingness, right? You are creating meaning, you are creating your life in the face of nothingness, the abyss, whatever you want to call it, but there is no, there's nobody watching, there's nobody in charge, right? So it basically is that responsibility. So the people in hell, if you did this kind of thing and you, you took out God from this, you took out the, d the divine aspects from it, the people in hell would still be obsessed mm -hmm. with their moment mm -hmm. of sin. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change what they do, right? The people, you know, they're, they're still going to live these little, tiny, small lives. And their effects on the world around them are going to be negative. Their effects on the world around them are to be to destroy those around them, to destroy themselves first through just incontinence, right? Or to destroy that themselves and take as much down with them as they can. So, watch the world burn. So, um, I have a question about the issue of authenticity regarding to reading. Mm -hmm. So it's more just a confirmation I'm not as familiar with Dante as you guys are, but would you say that um, the authenticity is which I'm really pleased with, it's really fascinating. Would you say that the authenticity you speak of is connected to, a, to an idea of singularity that, that means always living things up and new, sort of the, the, the refusal to repeat things again? So if you talk about someone being singular, something being singular, and I heard you both use the word, um, it sort of it, it goes into a Derridean idea of like you 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 don't want to be interpreted as part of something else. You sort of live anew all the time, even though you reach an impasse from time to time. Even though you sort of get to a point where um, I don't know, it's very hard to decide what the truth is. So my question is, um, I guess it's more of a comment is. Would you consider the Divine Comedies, some of its lasting, um, what's the word? Um, appeal. Whatever, <laughs> sure. Some of its lasting appeal to actually come from the act of reading the Divine Comedy as an authentic, singular document. Yeah, and, and I think that Rather this than interpreting it like the very act of reading the text. Yeah, I, yeah, I, th I think so, and I think that there's also a consideration here. Um, in doing a presentation a few days ago, the concept of using the past based on the present, the kind of colonialization of the past in our interpretation. I was giving that a good deal of thought in relationship to the comedy. And it came to me, and this is maybe that singularity that you're talking about. Dante was writing in the 1300s. The things that he was experiencing, the things that he was dealing with in his life are not that different than the things that we are dealing with today. That sense of the essence of being human really hasn't changed much over those intervening years. Love is still here. Hate is still here. Desire is still here. All of these things that are discussed are as contemporary today as they were when he wrote them. He had used, obviously, people that he knew. And some of that's interesting, some of it you can tell he's getting back at people. But I think in that sense, it really, I think the, the longevity of this is twofold. I think great works of art always provide more for you every time you go back to it. I've read this now 12 times. And every time I go back to it, I find something new. But the things that bring me back are those things that I have in my life experienced and can see in these descriptions. I don't think any of us are singularly in the inferno, singularly in 
purgatory or singularly in paradise. And I think in that sense, that may be that, that singularity of a human experience that's being dealt with here. I think also, it's funny when you mentioned Derrida, like immediately lights went on, but only because what we're looking at, especially with Aquinas, there couldn't be more polar opposites. Only because Aquinas has that belief, and he's the one, you know, everybody says De that, that Descartes is responsible for this, but really it's Aquinas. Aquinas, this, this idea that the intellect can know itself fully in the act of knowing. This is the most logocentric, logocentric idea there is. I mean, it is the logos. That is truth, right? So if you take that part out, right, it, it's, <coughs> the interesting part is that it still works in the divine comedy because it works almost as an artifact of that conceit, right? The idea that the people in heaven are the people that know their intellect in the act of knowing, and that the people in hell are the ones that really are just thinking with their senses and their bodies and in their own singularity. So I think that, that if, if, we're, if we're looking at this, this concept of authenticity, it is an authenticity with an agenda of truth, and as I say in class, truth with a capital T, right? This, this it, it's contingent upon this idea of truth. And I think if we, if we go back, and it, it speaks a little to the, that existentialism as well, is that the structure, this isn't gonna sound right, but it's the best I can do. <laughs> the structure of how we judge something as authentic still holds. So the structure here of the knowing that holds from Aquinas through to even up into Derrida and beyond. But it's the content, it's what is known or what can be known. Does right. that make sense? Right. Yeah. yeah. I think that, that's fair. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're right. And one, one of the things that I found is. Again, going through this, I was reading through this again, and I found something this time that I was not aware of in the past. That I'm trying to now create some kind of a uh, conspiracy theory about. <laughs> uh, because I think we don't have nearly enough conspiracy theories out there. Dante, like Milton, uses the term Lucifer. I was telling Anthony about this. Lucifer is an interesting term because he had the ability to use Satan. He could have used any name that he wanted to. So in selecting a particular name, there must be a reason for that. Lucifer, in theology, is the bringer of light. Lucifer is the morning star. Lucifer is Venus. <laughs> in fact, in the fourth century, Lucifer often referred to Jesus as the bringer of light. Why choose Lucifer? Lucifer was also the name of Satan before he was cast out. Is Dante saying even Lucifer is still in heaven? He has not been cast out. Why use that name when all other names are available? I just I was reading over that before I came over here and found that fascinating. The earliest reference to a deity in the morning star is a Canaanite reference. A god named Alta tried to sit on the throne of Baal, found that he couldn't, so descended and took up dominance in the underworld. I thought that's a very that's a very familiar sounding story, isn't it? But this whole notion of Lucifer, Lucifer in Latin means bringer of light. So if you look at the use of that, there's got to be a reason that he selected that term. Milton uses a Lucifer. And I'm very interested in pursuing that concept. Why that name? All names are possible. Why that name? Something I just found in going through it this time. Other questions? I have a question for you. Um, could you clarify a little bit? You talked about the body as being like the center of choice. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm not sure why it's the body that makes a choice and not the logic. The center of body, the... You said that the body, mm -hmm. the people are special because they oh, have yeah. a body which mm -hmm. is able to choose. Right. So again, the body is only used as a tool in the mm -hmm. alignment of the body and the logic. Right. But why is it the body that chooses? How is, it's not necessarily, it's, it's a unified body that chooses. Right, so there's the difference. It's a unified body, I can clarify that. It's, a, it's the unified body that makes a choice. So when you, it's because if you think about it this way, if you make a choice in your mind, right, in the physical realm, how do you know what that choice is? How does anybody know what that choice is? The only way that choice and volition is expressed, or it can be expressed, is through, in, in a Tomasian system, in a Tomasian system now, the only way that volition can be expressed is, is, as a human being, is through the body, is through a physical, you know, a physical act or as a representation of a choice. You see, so, you know, I want to move my arm right now, I can move my arm, or I want to pick this up, I can do that. But in order for anyone else in the world, any other physical being, to know what I'm doing, right, I need to do something physical to make that thought known. So it's, it's a unified physicality. It's, it's that union of body and soul where that occurs. It's um, not necessarily, and that's, I mean, that's what makes, I mean, if, if you look at the narrative of, of any of the Judeo-Christian narratives, that's what make, makes God God, is that God can know what, you, what's, what you're thinking because of God, right? And you don't need to show that physical kind of thing. And that also is the basis of a lot of the religious schisms that happen, right? Can you, can, is it by thought or is it by deed, right? How do, you, how do you achieve heaven, right? Do you achieve heaven by saying some magic words or do you achieve heaven by doing something, right? And that's the kind of, that's the kind of, of, of difference or do you achieve heaven just by your state of mind, right? Are you saved just by an ex some, kind of, some kind of mental acceptance of something? And that's why you have these, these, these kind of shifts and schisms that occur. But it is, in a Tomasian system, it is the unified self that can express that choice in religion. So can you then say that Protestantism originated as a revolution toward, <laughs> to uh, that Aquinas? I would, say, I would say that, yeah, I would say that Protestant. I mean, I think Aquinas came a little, he was a little too late. I think that the seeds had already been sown. I think that that had already happened because Aquinas, you know, Aquinas, it was through Aquinas that the church kind of reformed itself after the Reformation because it was that, because Aquinas wasn't accepted as soon as he, you know, it took, a, it took a few centuries after he died before it became the catechism, which is why, you know, in my philosophy 101s, all the kids that went to Catholic school get Aquinas and they don't know why. <laughs> they don't know why. I mean, yeah, they don't know why they get Aquinas, and they get Aquinas because they went to Catholic school, and that's how they were taught. So I think that it's just not. Um, yeah, I would. Ag I would agree. I, I really would. But, um, oh. Um, I just wondered why, if the body is there to limit the logic of the soul that is already perfect, would, if you are in. If, wouldn't you be pissed too? I mean, if, <laughs> like, you know, like your body, it does its own thing. It has its own impulses, it oh, yeah. its own thing. But like the soul, I guess, is perfect, apparently. So, and then you're being punished for eternity physically. But you know, like if I had a perfect logic, I'd be pissed that I was being punished. <laughs> so how does how is that reconciled? It doesn't make it doesn't make sense why the body is punished if the soul is perfect. I, I can answer, I'm going to transgress here and answer from the literary standpoint, okay? If you look at, in Dante's Inferno, right in where the neutrals are, in anti-hell up there at the top, there's where the philosophers are. The philosophers are in the garden spot of hell. They're not being tortured. They're in like a green, they're in a green part of hell. Mm -hmm. And their hell is to be amongst themselves. Right, and these were philosophers who were born before Jesus, so they had no sense, no chance at redemption. Right, and they are there, and they're talking to each other throughout eternity. Now, if you're a philosopher amongst other philosophers, what better to do than to talk philosophy for eternity? But here's the thing: they can see the Imperium. They can see, you know, they have within them, or they understand 
where they kind of understand that there's more, and that they, what I like to say is, they, they see that they might have been wrong. <laughs> and that's what tortures them, is this mental idea that, yeah, we can talk about all of this, but there was so much more we didn't know, and, you know, it's kind of sad. But I think that the, the, the body aspect here, it's, a, it's what helps to, to, to kind of make that a little easier to understand, is when you realize, again, that ancient or medieval cosmology that says, or that, that body, that sense of what the body is, that all emotions come from the body and that the mind is pure. So, so is it your fault then? Maybe you just got a bad body. <laughs> <laughs> really though, I mean, and, and if your intellect is pure and you've got a body that like, you know, wants to do certain things that people don't think are okay, I would be angry too. Mm -hmm. How is that reconciled? But I think that you're, you say that you've got a pure soul, okay? And my interpretation of the literary is a little different than yeah. the Tomasian, okay? So I understand that. And that is that the souls that find themselves in the inferno can't possibly say what you just said. They yeah. must say it's somebody else's fault. Divine authority. Okay? So that if you transgress, you are not the source of the transgression. Somebody else is. Something else is. Mom made me do it. I can blame mom and dad. I can blame the church. I can blame the government. It's not my responsibility. So in that sense, the soul is still connected to that sense of earthly structure. Because if the soul is actually liberated and in paradise, it's not connected to that guilt. There is no guilt in the Imperium. There is no blaming in the Imperium. It is total, absolute acceptance that no matter what you do, no matter where you are, you're always in heaven. You're in heaven. According to this, you're in heaven right now. Okay? Because they're all floating around out there. Okay? The only reason you don't know it is because your body is trying to say to you, I'm here. I'm not there. I'm here. Although, in the Imperium, everywhere is everywhere. Everything is always. And in that sense, also, I think that in the description of the philosophers, is they too are in heaven. In Dante's concept, all of this, all of this is merely a belief system by those that are there. That's why I'm becoming more and more and more convinced that the choice of Lucifer is the unfallen angel who is still in heaven but chooses to believe for his purposes that he is in fact cast out. Because if I'm cast out, who's casting me out? Am I? You are. It's your fault. It's not my fault. So I think in that sense, it's kind of, you've got to step away from the idea of the other and accept that sense of, again, that sense of this, it, we are a single entity, a single thing within a religious concept. You are a single thing within the mind of God. And that's what really the Imperium is. Because I think one of the fascinating things about that, you see here a nice little mountain. Mm -hmm. You see hell and earth. Okay? You start going up into the Ptolemaic concept of the but once you get into the Imperium, what is it? How's it depicted? It's a rose. It's a flower. <laughs> what is it? Where is it? Well it's everywhere. So in that sense, no matter what you think, no matter what you feel, no matter how pissed off you are, if you realize you're in heaven, you're in heaven. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen the movie, um, What, uh, what, what, dreams, may what yeah. dreams May Come? That's it. That's the whole story right there. But in that case, the character that is played by um, Robert Williams, Robert Williams dies. Mm -hmm. He has to die to get to his wife. Mm -hmm. In this, Dante lives. In fact, you know, why is it, some people will say, why is this a comedy? It's not very funny. 
<laughs> but it's not, because within literature, comedies are differentiated from tragedies in as much as the main character is confronted with a task, a journey, he survives that, lives, and can move on. Tragedy is the main character dies. Yeah. yeah. Even though there was some funny stuff in this. <laughs> but, you know, I guess it depends on your sense of humor. Yeah, yeah that last bit, um, when he's trying to describe it, um, I wish to see the way in which our human effigy suited the circle and found place in it. So I wanted to see how I found, you know, where what my place in this Imperium was, right? And my own wings were far too weak for that. But then my mind was struck by light, my mind was struck by light, that flashed and with this light received what it had asked. Here, force physical force failed my high fantasy, but my desire and will were moved already like a wheel revolving uniformly by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. So it's a movement. He's, he, can, he can apprehend that it's a movement, and he can apprehend a perfection as we apprehend a circle, right? We see the perfection of a circle, and we're apprehending this, this perfect form, but we're not apprehending the perfect form. We're just seeing an image of it. It's similar with Dante. As long as he's got eyes, as long as he's got a body, his wings are too weak. Hence, wings too weak. <laughs> so, you know, so, yeah. But that's, that's, I mean, it really is a, a it, it is, it's limiting, but the, this is, this is why, and, and it's hard to, it, it's so hard for me to get this, to, to get this across, but, why I find Aquinas so fascinating is because he takes that limitation and he, he privileges humanity with it by saying that despite that limitation, we have a choice. And what makes us special is that we actually, think about this for a minute, we actually can turn away from divine logic. That's huge. We can sit there and say, oh, there's this movement that's pulling me and I know what I'm supposed to do and I feel it, and I feel it, but I'm going to say no, and I'm going to kill this guy, right? And you can do that, right? <laughs> but isn't the movement really the body that's pulling you towards something? But you're div you're not turning away from divine logic. You're turning away from bodily logic, your lo which is an opposite logic of what you should be turning away from. Your divine logic, no, your body is the one that's, that's allowing you to express your body is expressing, because if you want to do that, but that means your body is the thing that's getting in the way. Uh-oh, Ricky's mad, look out. Uh -oh. <laughs> but, okay, but the thing, the, the, the things that you're in hell for, the things that are pulling you to do something, lust, mm -hmm. which we're talking gluttony, mm -hmm. you're, if you're being pulled towards that, why is that not the divine? <laughs> you're, you're talking to my, you're talking, you know. She's asking you about it. St. Thomas Aquinas. Because you want Why is it? divine something opposite of what you're being pulled towards? Claudia, did you want to? Well, yeah, I just want to throw in that it's actually interesting that if you give in to the body, you're not in hell, you're in purgatory, like, which, which is much better than hell because, <laughs> you know, once the evilness is burned away around your soul, the soul is, you know, clear and you're ready to go into paradise. So it's interesting when you look at some of the. And then I think that's what, uh, what Dr. McCauley explained. But if you look at here, the purgatory, like the lustful, the gluttonous, the slothful, the wrathful, all of that can be remedied. A little bit of purgatory, you're good to go. But when you look at like hell, you know, the, the, the hypocrites, the ones who lie under oath, the ones who betray their benefactors, that's, you use your mind to commit a sin. And that's much, much worse. And that, that gets you to hell. So I think it's different from the sort of modern interpretation of sin that, that we have in America today, where like the worst thing you could ever do is like have sex with somebody that you're not married with, you know? <laughs> so I think that was like what the sort of the most forgivable of sins is sort of the embodiment of you know morality today. So I think that um, it's a very interesting concept of what sin is. I'm happy with that. <laughs> so the, the body is the least problem you have. <laughs> Michael, did you? Yeah, I mean, we asked the question. I, mean, okay. I just wondered how the Judeo-Christian.
tradition plays into this. I mean, if you refuse the concept of hell, heaven to exist, this whole concept of you know philosophy will fall apart. And in some Asian cultures, in oh, yeah. some uh, non-Christian cultures, we have that where we don't even accept this and say we don't have any problem of this kind of, well, you can punish the body because the mind stays above it. It's, it's a holistic concept. So it's a narrowing idea of Christianity, really, that is reinforced in these philosophies mm -hmm. that we cannot get rid of. Right. Whether it's morality today or morality in the 14th century in the Renaissance. Yes, at that time. because existence gets linked with truth. What happens, and, and it starts, and it, this is one of the problems with Aquinas, where, but he's, he's, he's also working off of Plato, and it, it kind of goes, but what happens is, you start to, it, it, it finds its, its pinnacle in, for me, Descartes, because Descartes basically equates existence, truth, knowledge, human, and humanity, right? Plus divinity, all in one thing. He mashes it into this ball, and it takes, oh, 500 years, 400 years before we start to, the existentialists start to kind of pick away at it. But the interesting thing is, is that if you go from Eastern perspectives, right, where it's not a, an existence, non-existence logic, it is a creation, preservation, destruction. It's a three-part logic, right? And it, it moves in that way. It completely shifts the entire way we understand, it, it, it shifts epistemology, it shifts metaphysics, it shifts everything. But I think this, divine logic is existence for Aquinas. Existence is, and real existence, the soul is a pure existence within the body. It, it suffuses the body, it is a unity of the body, but we're special as human beings because we're the ones that can release that soul toward into the realm of divine logic. So yeah, it starts a lot of conceits, a lot of humanist conceits, where, you know, I think, therefore I am. My thinking gives me existence, and that's where Don, uh, Descartes pulls it away from, you know, Aquinas a little bit, and he brings it more into the realm of the humanist realm, and he, he kind of, you know, he brings, the way I say it is he brings God down a little bit this way, and he brings humanity up a little bit this way. You know, just by the statement, I think, therefore, I am. He's taking, you know, it's interesting, taking basically the name of God and linking it to human thought and saying that thinking is me. I am thinking. And you know, Mike, I also think that um, in Dante, I think you're seeing kind of the cusp between the medieval and the modern thinking. Because in going back and looking through this, I don't think the word... God appears in the entire Divine Comedy. He who is intellect, he that which is always a description, not of a religious entity, but of a mind. And um, obviously, that's not a point, but within this, I think that there's really that movement, almost a, the beginning of a humanist concept of an explanation for existence. Obviously Dante could not make that leap, but he was, I think that you're starting to see those early concepts there. Um, also in part of this, we are looking at an English translation mm -hmm. of an Italian piece of literature, which according to my professors was the source of organized Italian language. Dante did that. And the word hope, speranza, well it, it means more than hope. It also, mean, it also means desire and it also means wishes. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it within that concept, the thing about hope in there really is greater than just, oh I hope I'm going to get something for Christmas. <laughs> you know, it is desire, it's wishing. How do you get away from that? And it, beginning to study Italian, I'm starting to read this in Italian. And there are certain aspects of it that seem marginally different in the interpretation. Now, it's funny that um, Anthony and I both had exactly the same translation, which I was told was the, the best there is. But still there is that concept of 
authenticity, if you like, in language. Mm -hmm. And where are we able to move along those lines as well? But I think that this whole, this whole notion that Dante was really beginning to present ideas that would in fact blossom in the Renaissance um, is very important in this piece. And that's why I think it never became a real religious doctrine. You know, it was always, it was always outside. It never became a quasi-religious concept. Probably because the number of popes are in hell. Yeah. But um, you know, I think that was I think it was a real important aspect to it. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you for sticking around this long. Have a good night. It's not tearing down yet. Brian Barker wants really? photos for all this new stuff. I'm just going to grab a bunch of pictures. Kayla's mine. He wants some photos of new stuff. Yeah, I've got a lot of Oh, yeah, I was supposed to get him some photos. You can have it. So are we still broadcasting? Um, I think I'd have to read the first I'm glad you liked it, You guys want to look at me? Yes. 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 Yes.